This video is the second part of a two-part series breaking down the infamous Eternal Blue exploit. Eternal Blue is a sophisticated exploit that was secretly developed by the National Security Agency, a branch of the United States Department of Defense. After suffering a hack by a separate hacking group called the Shadow Brokers, Eternal Blue, along with a suite of other exploits, were publicly leaked. With the NSA's closest secrets becoming publicly available, various threat actors around the world began to incorporate them into their own malware. Despite multiple threat actors from multiple different countries rushing to develop new malware to serve a variety of purposes, they all had one thing in common. They were all computer worms. This means that once a single device is infected, it enacts a fully autonomous, self-replicating mechanism that enables it to silently spread across networks at an exponential rate, without requiring any user interaction. Due to the severity of the exploit, several of these newly developed attacks were among the most impactful cyber attacks the world has seen before, with millions of devices affected and tens of billions of dollars in damages reported. The United States was left making indictments to those alleged to be behind the attacks. To get a full picture of the events that transpired, check out the first part of the series, which is linked below. The first part left off after covering bugs A and B in the exploit chain, which work together to trigger a buffer overflow in the non-paged kernel pool. This is a form of an out-of-bounds write, where arbitrary, attacker-chosen data is able to be written into the memory location immediately following the nt list buffer. As discussed in the first video, being able to trigger a buffer overflow is one thing, but using one as the sole exploit to achieve a meaningful outcome for the attacker, such as executing arbitrary code, is an entirely different story. To understand the full extent of Eternal Blue, we'll first need to understand the last remaining bug, which enables the attacker to allocate a chunk of memory of arbitrary size in the non-paged pool. On its own, this may not seem that helpful, however all of these bugs are going to come together in the exploitation phase, where the non-paged pool of the target machine will be remotely groomed through a precisely choreographed sequence of packets. But I digress. Turning to bug C, let's see how we're able to force a memory allocation of arbitrary size. Before any SMB functionality takes place between two devices, such as the file sharing operations we saw before, the devices in question must complete an initial SMB handshake. The purpose of this handshake is to establish an SMB session between the devices. An SMB session serves to facilitate all network communication between the two devices, essentially putting them on the same page for what SMB version they're going to use with each other, and ensuring the client is authenticated for proper permissions and access control. Only after an SMB session is established between the devices can the underlying SMB functionality take place, such as creating a new file. Let's take a look at the SMB handshake in more detail. The first exchange of messages uses the SMB com negotiate command, which serves to determine the highest version of SMB dialect that both devices support, which will be agreed upon and used for all further communication. After negotiation, the second step in the handshake uses the SMB com session setup andex command, which serves to authenticate the client and establish the session. Bug C is triggered during this stage, when this session setup request is parsed incorrectly by the server. Let's take a look at the SMB com session setup andex request in more detail. This request is actually available in two different forms, being NT security and extended security, depending on the type of authentication being used. With both formats, the request is split up into two sections, being the SMB parameters and the SMB data. The SMB parameter struct contains a word count field that represents the total length of its members in word size. With the NT security format, word count will always be equal to 13, and with the extended security format, word count will always be equal to 12. Immediately following the parameter struct, there is an SMB data struct, which has a byte count field that represents the total length of its members in bytes. During parsing, the byte count field is used to determine the size of a memory allocation in the non-paged pool, which is intended to be the size of the SMB data block. When parsing these packets, there is a bug within SMB that wrongly extracts the value of byte count to a controlled value of the attacker's choosing. This is quite dangerous, as the target machine uses this value to determine the size of a memory allocation in the non-paged pool. 
As a result, because the attacker can directly control the size of this value, they also control the size of the memory allocation that the target machine will make. Let's see how this is done. To make a long story short, since there are two different versions of the SMBCOM session setup and X request, the target machine needs to determine which version of the request it received, so that it can dispatch the corresponding parsing function. The first one is used if it receives an extended security request, and the second one is used if it receives an NT security request. If the attacker sends a session setup request of the extended security type with a specific set of flags, it will be processed incorrectly as if it was of the NT security type. This is due to faulty logic in the if statement, which is the basis of bug C. Let's see how much damage this can actually cause. Despite the fact that the request was sent as an extended security with a word count of 12, the function will parse it as if it's an NT security with a word count of 13. Because of this, it reads the byte count from the wrong offset in the struct. Rather than reading the true byte count value, it will read from this field instead, wrongly assuming that it is reading the byte count. Since the byte count field is used to make an allocation in the non-paged pool, we can now force a much larger allocation than was intended. At this point, we know that the attacker can force an arbitrary memory allocation. What's especially important to note is that as soon as this specific SMB connection is closed, the allocation from bug C is going to immediately be freed, leaving behind an unallocated hole in memory. Keep this in mind, as this is crucial for the attack. Now that we have an understanding of the mechanics behind the buffer overflow caused by bugs A and B, and the arbitrary memory allocation caused by bug C, we now have all the ingredients needed to understand how everything comes together, enabling Eternal Blue to compromise the system. Before we begin, let's start by visualizing the non-paged pool of the device we're going to attack. Some chunks within the pool will be free, and others will be in use. The state of the pool is constantly changing, and is unknown to the attacker. Rather than consisting of a single transaction, Eternal Blue is going to require many different types of SMB connections being made to the device within very short and precise time intervals. We're going to begin by triggering bugs A and B, which entails sending a file-related operation containing an OS2 fee list that the target tries to convert into an NT fee list. Recall that to properly pull off the buffer overflow, this needs to be done with two different SMB packets. The interesting thing is that we're actually going to send these packets in at different times. Let's begin by sending in the first packet, which is the NT trans. Since we're holding off on sending in the second half of this transaction, a part of memory will be allocated to the OS2 fee list. However, a portion will be left free, since it's still waiting for the transaction to complete. The casting process to convert this into an NT fee list will not begin until the second packet is received. At this point, we're going to trigger bug C, which will allocate a chunk of memory of arbitrary size. We're actually going to make this size match the exact size as the soon-to-be-created NT fee list. We're actually going to leave the specific SMB connection used to cause this arbitrary memory allocation open for the time being, but recall that as soon as we choose to close the connection, this memory allocation will be freed, leaving behind an unallocated hole in its place. At this point, grooming of the non-paged pool will commence. There's a specific type of connection within SMB known as ServNet. For the time being, all you need to know about these ServNet connections is that when a ServNet connection is opened, a ServNet struct is allocated within this pool. We'll take a closer look at the internals of the ServNet struct later, but for now, we're just going to use them to groom the pool. Grooming refers to any technique that arranges memory in a way that makes it more predictable and exploitable to attackers. What we're going to do now is send a high volume of rapid ServNet connections to the device in order to fill up a bunch of free memory chunks with ServNet structs. We want to fill as many free chunks as possible to make the device's next move more predictable, essentially starving the target device of free memory. Hopefully, during the flooding of ServNet connections, a ServNet struct would have ended up in this exact position, directly following the chunk of memory allocated from bug C. We'll see why in a moment, but this positioning is necessary to pull off the attack. Keep in mind that this process is non-deterministic. 
In real life, this may take multiple back-to-back -back attempts, but eventually it will happen. What happens next is a carefully choreographed sequence of packets. We know that as soon as we send the final packet a part of bugs A and B, the server can finally commence the OS2 to NT casting operation, and will allocate space for the NT fee list. Our goal is to force this allocation to happen in the soon-to-be freed allocation of bug C. Because all the free memory chunks have been allocated by the incoming storm of servnet requests, there will not be much room for the NT fee list to be allocated. This is why immediately before the final packet of bugs A and B is sent, the connection of bug C will be closed, leaving a hole in memory of the perfect size for the soon-to-be-created NT fee list. Once this hole is created, we'll immediately send in the final trans2 secondary packet a part of bugs A and B. The server will receive it and begin the OS2 to NT casting process, where it will need to allocate some memory for the NT fee list. With all the other memory allocations being clogged up due to our grooming technique, it will conveniently find this free and appropriately sized chunk of memory perfect for the NT fee list allocation. Once the NT fee list fills this hole, we're almost done with the attack. We know that the NT fee list, as a result of bugs A and B, will overflow its boundary and perform an out-of-bounds write of arbitrary data. Because we groomed the memory pool into this perfectly controlled state, we know that the next chunk that it will overflow into is a servnet struct. This is crucial for the attack, as we are now able to overwrite whatever fields we like within the servnet struct. Now that we know this is possible, let's go ahead and take a closer look at the internals of the servnet struct. We're going to need to be aware of two main things within the servnet struct. First, there is a field called Memory Descriptor List, or MDL, which maps any incoming data a part of the servnet connection from the remote client to a specific virtual address. All it does is directs these incoming flows of data to a certain spot in memory. Because the out-of-bounds write enables us to overwrite fields within this servnet struct, we can overwrite the MDL field itself meaning we can direct these flows of data to wherever we want within memory. The MDL will be overwritten to send the data to a static address, such as an address in the HAL's heap within Windows. HAL.dll, known as the hardware abstraction layer, is just a default Windows module that is loaded in at startup. We're choosing to use HAL's heap just because it has execute permissions in Windows versions prior to Windows 8, among other reasons. As a result, arbitrary data that we send in over the servnet connection will be placed within HAL's heap. In addition to this, there's a pointer to a servnet WSK struct. This struct then contains, among other fields, a pointer to a handler function, which is called when the servnet connection is closed. This is going to play a key role in the attack. Just keep in mind that whenever this specific servnet connection is closed, the target device will attempt to locate and execute the handler function, which is contained within the servnet WSK struct. The second thing we're going to overwrite in the servnet struct is the pointer to the servnet WSK struct, making it point to the exact same address in HAL's heap that we selected for the MDL. This means that rather than pointing to the real servnet WSK struct, it is going to point to a place that can contain attacker-injected data instead. With this, all of our work is now done. Let's see what happens when we send in some carefully crafted data over the servnet connection. Because we overwrote the MDL, it will end up being placed within a known location in the house heap. The data that we're sending in at this phase is actually a fake version of the servnet WSK struct. Because we also overwrote the pointer to the servnet WSK struct to point to the same memory location, it now points to this fake servnet WSK struct instead of the real servnet WSK struct. Of course, the fake struct was carefully crafted by the attacker. In addition to sending in a fake struct, we're also going to send in a payload directly after it. The payload refers to the piece of code that we want to remotely execute on the system, to serve the purpose and objectives of the attacker. 
Eternal Blue is an exploit that aims to achieve a remote code execution, and the payload is the specific piece of code that we are going to be executing. In the specific case of WannaCry, the double pulsar backdoor was used as the payload, which was actually leaked from the NSA alongside Eternal Blue, but you could send in any arbitrary payload at this point. The key to this attack is that the handler function, a part of the fake struct, was made to point to the payload. At this point, all of our work is now done. The dominoes have been laid out perfectly. As soon as we terminate our servnet connection, the target device will attempt to locate and execute the handler function, which is contained within the servnet WSK struct. Of course, when it goes to find this struct, it will actually be pointed to the fake servnet WSK struct instead. Recall that within this fake struct, which was crafted by the attacker, the handler function was made to point to the payload. As a result, when it goes to execute the handler function, execution flow will be directed to the attacker-injected payload. This means that the backdoor will execute, achieving our long-sought-after RCE. At this point, the payload is free to do whatever it intends on doing, such as encrypting all of the system's files, demanding a ransom, or whatever else it was programmed to do. Eternal Blue is just an exploit used to achieve an RCE, and it doesn't need to be used with any specific type of payload. Of course, Eternal Blue was already patched before it was used in any widespread attacks. Most of the damage could have been avoided if server farms and data centers kept up to date on their OS updates. If you want to stay up to date on your knowledge, understanding, and problem-solving skills, you're in the right place. Have you ever wanted to take a deep dive behind the scenes of some of the most relevant and impactful areas of tech, such as how content goes viral on X, how to achieve optimal Airbnb rental values, topping the charts with Spotify, or the economics of the rise of electric vehicles? If so, look no further than this video sponsor, Brilliant. These are just a few examples of the latest additions to their ever-expanding library of thousands of interactive lessons in math, programming, computer science, data science, and AI. All content on Brilliant is crafted by thought leaders and industry partners. Take for instance one of my recent favorites, their course on quantum computing, which was made in collaboration with both Google and Microsoft. In other areas, fellow YouTube channels were brought on board to help develop their own courses in their area of expertise. Brilliant is a learning platform designed to be uniquely effective. Their first principles approach helps you build understanding from the ground up, ensuring you have a strong foundation to build off of and filling in any knowledge gaps you may have. In addition to gaining knowledge, you'll also learn to apply it to real-world situations, as all of their lessons are filled with real-world, hands-on problem-solving scenarios, designed to build critical thinking skills that will stick with you across different subjects. With Brilliant, you can explore just about whatever you're curious about, playing with concepts in real time, until they just click. Take for instance their new data-focused courses, where the seemingly advanced models running our world are demystified, letting you explore and visualize real-world datasets from sources such as Starbucks, Twitter, Spotify, and more. In their most recent course, you'll learn how to combine information from multiple sources into multi-variable models in order to make optimal housing price predictions. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, Visit Brilliant.org slash Daniel Bachter or click the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Thanks again to Brilliant for making this series possible. If you're interested in more vulnerability breakdowns, check out these videos, and subscribe to the channel for more content. Thanks for watching.